Welcome everybody to the final day of week eight. And we're going to be hopefully finishing up our uh, diversion into fallacies and cognitive biases today. Uh, fallacies, again, are bad arguments and cognitive biases are the uh, flaws or weaknesses or shortcuts the brain takes um, that leads oftentimes to fallacious thinking. Okay. So uh, a cognitive distortion is when your brain doesn't have kind of like a good grasp on reality. And, um, you know, there, there's probably an open philosophical question there of, <laughs> you know, like, how does the therapist know what reality is? You know, like, there, there's probably some, uh, <laughs> you know, like, do you actually know if you're a brain in a vat or not? You know, are you in the matrix? Uh, but, uh, yeah, in general, I think we've all met people whose view of reality is just very detached from how reality actually is. And so there's uh, various forms of therapy where they sort of walk you through your thought process and like, all right, do you know this to be true? Are you guessing? You know, like, what do you know for sure? What do you kind of know? You know, that kind of stuff. And uh, if you've ever played uh, like Persona 5, it's very much based on this concept. It's based on Jungian um, psychology, the notion of you know, the anima and the shadow and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the um, uh, the villains in Persona 5 are just regular people whose cognitive distortions have grown so strong they create these, uh, these mind palaces filled with monsters and things like that that the Phantom Thieves have to go into and uh, essentially correct their self-delusion. It's a, it's a very psychological uh, JRPG series, really. Okay. So Persona 5... If you're into Japanese role-playing games, it's a fantastic example of one. All right, so let's let's get into it. Uh, you play Persona? Yeah, yeah. So I, I teach video game development. Like you know, it shouldn't be a surprise. You know that <laughs> you know, video game professor plays video games. Um, I'm not as deep into it as like uh, one of my students yesterday. He uh, he beat Persona Five, and then Persona Five Royal Edition came out the next day, and immediately started a new game and played it through again. I. I do not have that amount of dedication or time. You know, I have a family. <laughs> Sad. I know. I wish I had more time for video games. No, I'm kidding. My family's great. Okay, so uh, the uh, the mind reading uh, is a very common is a very common problem uh, that uh, a lot of people have, which is that we think we know what other people are thinking. Right? It's very common because that's kind of how the human the human brain works, right? Like you're, you're, you know, you're giving a talk and you're looking around and everyone's just kind of like, uh, kill me. You know, you're like, okay, uh, they're bored. I, I need to like, just wrap this up real fast or something, you know? Um, uh, so, I mean, mind reading is like, like we devote a lot of our brains to trying, trying to simulate other people's brains, you know, and trying to figure out what they're thinking, what they're feeling about us, especially and things like that. Uh, the trouble is, is that a lot of the times uh, we're just wrong. Right, and so a lot of the times we think we know what other people are thinking, and um, it's just completely wrong. You know, like um, everyone knows I was late to work today. Eh, no, like maybe they do. Like if you're somebody who habitually comes in late, like you know, you're yeah, pretty much everyone knows you you're you're a late person, right? Uh, kind of like reading body language. Yeah, like we like we do it. The the important thing to keep in mind is we're wrong a lot. You know, I remember texting a person. And then uh, I got in my car to go to the park or something. And, and when I got to the park, I checked my texts and I had like five text messages like, why aren't you responding to me? Are you mad? I'm so sorry. And I'm like, N no, bro, I was just, I was just dry. I was in my car for like 10 minutes. Like, you know, but you know, they interpreted the, uh, the, the delay in responding on a text as me being mad or checking out of the conversation. I don't really remember what, but it, it just struck me like they, they completely misread the situation, you know, because for me on text, like I will take my time <laughs> responding to you on a text. Like if I got things going on, that's why it's a text message and not a phone conversation. You know what I mean? Guilty. <laughs> you know, and so like, you know, if I text somebody like it, it's, I, I think of it more mentally as email rather than like a phone conversation. Although if you're going back and forth and all of a sudden there's a long pause, like, Hey, you want to go out on a date? And then there's just like an hour long pause and then you just get a read notification an hour long that you're just like <laughs> um but uh yeah but seriously like we we misread these things all the time right and um 
I know she hates me because she didn't answer my email. Well, she could have gone to a car accident. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons, like, or got spam filtered. Like, you, you really have to be careful how much you read into things like that, you know? So, um, yeah, a lot of times you, you just increase your own anxiety for no reason whatsoever, you know? So, uh, black and white thinking is the second cognitive distortion uh, that we're talking about today. And black and white thinking underlies the all or nothing um, <clears throat> fallacy that we've talked about a little bit before. And uh, something's all good or all bad. My boyfriend is perfect. Yeah, guess what? Nobody's perfect. No, nobody's perfect, right? And that's something that, like, <clears throat> Twitter has a hard time dealing with, right? Somebody's all hero or all villain. And there are some people, like, you know, Hitler or Stalin, that I would say are, you know, villains. Like, like you, you, I don't even really... Pol Pot, right? The Killing Fields, right? Like, I don't really have to think about that. Like, they're villains, right? Uh, but at the same time, like, yeah, like, and, and so what happens is that, you know, if, if the boyfriend does one thing wrong, then, uh, then that means he's not all good. He must be all bad and instant breakup, you know, things like that. So, um, uh, Richard Stallman, who, uh, I, I told you maybe last time we were going to talk about, um, Richard Stallman is a really cool guy. I like him a lot. He spent the night at my house, uh. He's one of the most important people in computer science. Um, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Linus Torvalds, um, Eric S. Raymond, and, and Richard Stallman, I would say, are probably, uh, Steve Wozniak also from Apple, are probably the, the five or six most important people in all of computer science. And uh, Jobs is dead, um, Gates is retired, Eric S. Raymond is still kind of tooling around, I guess. Um, but Salman is still alive and touring and talking and things like that. And his um, his whole thing is about how can I summarize his philosophy in a nutshell? Uh, you should have access to all the source code of everything you run. Every time you run a program, you should be able to look at and inspect the source code to it and change it if you want to. That's a big part of it. But at a, at a deeper level, it's about respecting people's liberties and privacies. And so. Um, you know, he doesn't want you taking a photo of him and putting on a Facebook because now Facebook knows where he is. You know, like I said, he's he's one of the hardest people to track because he he, he has devoted his life to it, right? He doesn't use uh, cell phones. Or actually, he has a cell phone, but he pulls the battery out. And he has a cell phone that he can pull the battery out on. I can't on mine. Because even if you turn your cell phone off, like the screen off like that, guess what? It's still reporting its location to Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T, whoever it is that you use. So uh, even if your screen's not on, uh, the cell phone company, and hence the government, if it cares, uh, knows where you are within about a 10 meter radius at all times, right? And so the only way that you can um, not be tracked like that is to turn your cell phone off. Uh, however, the NSA in the past has uh, installed viruses that even when you power down your phone, uh, it's not actually off. And it's actually still transmitting your location. So. Stallman has a phone that he pulls the battery out of. So like when we went to lunch together, he's like, everybody turn off their cell phones. And he pop, pops the back of his phone off, pulls the battery out. And then you go to lunch together, no cell phones, um, no ability to track his movements, things like that. He pays in cash for everything because uh, cash is untraceable. And it, 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 it costs him, right? It's not easy to get a hold of him, right? Like if you're, if you're trying to reach him, you send him an email, then he'll call you back, right? From a landline or, or you know, from he'll go to a Starbucks and something like that. So um, yeah, I, I don't know if uh, you've seen pictures of Stallman before. You you can tell he's a Unix guy. So you you can tell you you can tell he's a Unix guy from the uh, from from <laughs> yeah that's an old photo of him. Um, but he, uh, he created uh, the GNU and uh, Free Software Foundation. Um, and uh, one of the most important things that he did was something called the GPL. And so the GPL underlies a lot of our software. And what it, what it says is um, this source code that I'm writing is open source. You're free to copy it, modify it, use it however you want. But if you do, you got to publish your changes. And so it's a viral it's a viral license and that basically says like if Google takes my GPL source code and uses it and modifies it, they have to release their changes. And so it benefits everybody. And this, this is 
something that probably most people have never heard of, and it is one of the most important things that has ever happened in the development of technology and the internet and software and things like that. So, um, yeah. So he cares a lot about freedom and privacy. He's also uh, very much engages in black and white thinking. So when he came over to my house, uh, he patted down his pockets and he couldn't find a chocolate bar uh, that he had bought for me as thanks for letting, uh, letting him stay at my house. And he, he started panicking. He's like, oh, everything is ruined. Everything is ruined. I'm like, it's not ruined. He's like, how do you know that? How do you know it's not ruined? You know, and, and uh, just in the, in the day or two that we spent with each other, like over and over again, it's just everything's catastrophic. Everything's horrible. And, oh, I found it. Here we go. I, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to share a, a, a chocolate bar with you to, to thank you. You know, and, um, oh, I found it. Okay, here we go. You know, and, I, and it's just like a grocery store chocolate bar. Like it wasn't like some sort of like secret Richard Stallman chocolate bar. So it was just like from the grocery store. And then we split it and we ate it and everything was fine again, you know. So, uh, uh, how do you know? Uh, I, I invited him to come out to give a, a talk at our college. And uh, he accepted and flew out. And uh, he doesn't like staying in hotels because then he's tracked. So he flew out to the Bay Area and a friend of mine drove him from the Bay Area to here. And... Um, and we had dinner together and spent a day or two together. And yeah, uh, he's a, I, I like him a lot. He's a weird dude, but I like him a lot. That's, that's the best way of putting it. Uh, he comes into my house and he just very slowly just inspects every bit of artwork I have up in my house, reads the name of every book I have in the bookshelves. Just not saying anything. Just, just, he just very slowly just goes through the library. Every so often he asks the questions like, are, are all these arts uh, in a series or something? I'm like, yeah, yeah, they are. Like, yeah, cool. You know, and, it was just a, it was kind of an interesting experience having you know one of the most famous people in the world just staying at your house. Uh, I was playing a board game and he wandered over and was like, "All right, explain the rules of the board game to me." And I'm explaining. He's like, "Oh, that's not very realistic." And then he goes back to his laptop and types away. And we watched Doctor Who together. I don't know. So, um, wonder why he's so paranoid about being tracked. Uh, he's um, that that's like his thing, right? Like his thing is very much about privacy. And liberty, right? Very hundred percent, you know, down that path. I'm not like, you know, my my cell phone here runs Android, which is kind of open source, but also kind of not. Um, my Linux box is, I think, pretty much all free and open source, but I'm not positive. You know, like Stallman would, you know, I, I asked him about it. I'm like, you know, I, you know, I ran a tool that inspected my server for any non-free software and it didn't find anything. It's like, well, how do you know the tool works? I'm like, I don't. <laughs> you know, but it's good enough for me. You know, like so, I'm I'm kind of at a, kind of at a, you know, more milk toast version of, of of Stallman. I would say. Okay. So what a flex uh, from your professor. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's just I don't know. It's a weird experience. So um, yeah, false dichotomy. Uh, I don't know if we went over false dichotomy. False dichotomy is when you say, well, either. Uh, you were beating your wife now, or you were beating her in the past. Like, no, there's other options. The false dichotomy is when you present two options that that you must be one of these two things, and those aren't ex exhaustive. Like, there's other options as well. Like, I'm not beating my wife, which I'm not, right? So, um, yeah, this is a one of the most common cognitive distortions there is. Everything's all good. Everything's all bad false dichotomy you must either be with us or you're against us george w bush right on the eve of the uh, gulf war ii conflict right you're either with us or you're against us you know it's black and white thinking false dichotomy all or nothing you're all good or uh, you're all evil so um yeah so uh yeah be be aware of that like in the real world there's there you know there's shades of gray there's some, there's some good people that have done bad in the past there's bad people that have done some good in the past you know even bad people generally think of themselves as good right um it's, it's very rare for people to portray themselves as villains you know what I mean? well i just had to do it uh catastrophic thinking yeah okay that's also richard stallman right uh r always run in worst case scenarios rather than focusing on likely scenarios right i'm never going to graduate from college they're gonna fire me. Everything is ruined, Richard Stallman. Don't tell me it's okay. You can't know that. Also, Stallman. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, he, yeah, he's a cool dude. Um, 
people worry more about, you know, probably the war in Ukraine than, I don't know. I mean, if you're Ukrainian, I guess, but, you know, the odds are a lot higher you're going to die of COVID, right? Even now, right? Than getting, you know, nuked by Putin. So far, so good, right? But who knows? It's the future. Um, yeah, but I mean, if you look at like what people are stressing over right now, like, you know, 80% of Americans are experiencing stress from the Ukrainian war conflict, whatever you want to call it. You know, 80%, 80% of Americans are experiencing stress because of it. And that's on top of this stress we're experiencing from, oh, I don't know, a two year pandemic, uh, <laughs> on top of, you know, inflation and the, whatever the hell is happening to our economy right now with the supply chain and cars unavailable. Like there's a lot of things to stress out about, you know? And, uh, if you, if you allow yourself to engage in catastrophic thinking, like your stress levels fly through the roof. And uh, if you've got resiliency, if you've got, you know, some mental habits of like, you know, meditation especially has been really good for me to build up my, my chill. Um, like you can handle like one thing, but then when like three things happen at the same time, it's just like devastating. You know what I mean? It's devastating. So, um, you know. It's important to sort of propor proportion proportion your uh, fears to the likelihood they happen, right? So um, don't always immediately flip to disaster mode. You know, it's not healthy for you. Uh, parasocial relationships. So the human brain's weird. I mean, I think I think we all know that, right? But. We form friendships with people who we spend time with and like and have kind of a grasp on their emotions and and things like that. Like we, you know, I, I could I could picture my friend right now and I could imagine like if I said something to him, what he would say back, you know, that kind of stuff. That's kind of like what being a friend is like. You have positive emotions towards him or her, but also you have sort of a mental model of what they're like and how they would react to you and things like that. You can kind of run through scenarios in your head and stuff like that. So, so can I understand how a chip is affecting car manufacturing? Because uh, cars nowadays are highly computerized. Um, I have friends that have worked in that industry, like programmers, right? And um, uh, it used to be like if you, uh, if you hit the uh, windshield wiper on your car, it would uh, activate what's called a 555 timer on your your car windshield wiper and so um, these are very cheap uh, the mono stable multi-vibrator um, inter introduced in 1972 let's see what it cost how much would it cost to make one of these things uh, 50 cents maybe I don't know 50 of them for seven dollars so they're like yeah, these are 50 cents these are even cheaper, right? They're super cheap. And you only need one of these things and you can hook that up to the servo motors and your uh, windshield wiper. And so when you tap the thing, the windshield start going, you tap it again, it goes faster, right? Like that's how it used to be. Like you just have like a chip or something like that. Controlling it. Nowadays, it's all like CPUs and, and things like that, which are even more expensive. And the trouble is like if your um, car company cancels the orders for chips because nobody is buying cars because there's a pandemic, and then suddenly you start making cars again, you don't have any chips on hand. And you go to the chip company to be like, hey, I, I need those chips. And they're like, you canceled your order, you're at the back of the line now, you know? And so wait two years. So that's why there's a chip shortage for like Ford and GM and things like that. Um, and uh, TSMC, which is the uh, world's best chip manufacturer right now, uh, I can say that without qualification because they've eclipsed um, everyone else. So TSMC is Taiwan's, I think, most important company, uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing uh, Corporation. Um, they, uh, <laughs> they're they taking up, like, there's water shortages in Taiwan, and you need water to make chips. Like, there's a lot of factors that go on. Uh, but basically, um, you know, like, Taiwan is paying farmers not to grow crops because they need the water for chip manufacturing. Like, there's a whole bunch of, like, really interesting knock-on effects. Like, this happens, then this causes this to happen. This causes this to happen. You know, the um, the introduction of ethanol gasoline in America caused tortilla shortages in Mexico, right? 
And you would think it's because ethanol, which comes from corn, tortillas are made from corn, that would cause it. No, wrong. Different kind of corn is actually used for ethanol and for tortillas. Um, but there was a series of knock-on effects. Like basically the leftover stuff that was used for like feeding animals was used and then this caused a shortage here and this caused a shortage here and the, there were tortilla riots in Mexico because of the introduction of ethanol. Like all of these things are very complicated, right? The, the world is a very complicated place. So, um, um, you know, and it takes time to study it. Like I bought a book on the subject, like, you know, the, you know, all the, the, the economics of food, it was called. And, um, and it ran through the step by step by step. This caused this, this caused this, this caused this. So anyhow, so coming back to what I was saying about friends, how many people here have a, um, favorite YouTuber or streamer or I don't know, celebrity that they like to watch? You know, that, uh, you know, like my daughter likes watching Doug Doug, who does like crazy things using like Grand Theft Auto and Red Dead Redemption and things like that. Skyrim also. Uh, yeah, a lot. I used to see. Yes. So, um, most moist, moist critical. <laughs> okay. Um, and so it's really interesting, psychologically speaking, is that the uh, the mental model we have of these celebrities, YouTubers, streamers, whatever, is very similar to the same thing that we have with a friend. And so it feels like they're our friend, but they're not because they've never heard of us, right? Like Doug Doug has never heard of me or my daughter, you know, like he probably doesn't care. I don't contribute to his Patreon or anything like that. You know, like, you know, it's, <clears throat> who am I to Hecate or Hecate to me, right? And so, uh, you know, me personally, like, uh, I watch uh, Abroad in Japan a lot, um, and uh, Chris Broad, who's a, a very hilarious, um, sarcastic British streamer who lives in Japan, uh, just interviewed Ken Watanabe, Watanabe for, uh, like, a week, and uh, so we just watched that video last night, and uh, my wife and I are talking, like, how did he get access to Ken Watanabe? Why am I not saying his name right? Ken Watanabe. Watanabe, yeah, Watanabe, Ken Watanabe. So, uh, let them fight, right? Um, and so we were talking about, like, you know, Chris doesn't have those level of contacts, yet, like, he's our friend. Like, how, did he, how the hell did he score, you know, a week-long interview with, uh, you know, one of these, you know, Oscar-nominated actor, Ken Watanabe? You know, like, and, and we're talking about it, like, oh, he must, yeah, he's done a lot of, uh, he's done a lot of interviews in the, uh, Tohaku region of Japan. Uh, he's, he's cared a lot about, uh, you know, Aomori and uh, Yamagata prefecture. And, and, you know, he did, he did that special a while back on the, on the tsunami. And I bet that's how, I bet those people like put him in contact with Ken Watanabe because Ken Watanabe also does a lot of tsunami relief works. And, you know, and we're like talking about this guy, like he's our friend, you know, and he's never met us. He doesn't know who the hell I am and, and doesn't care, you know? Um, oh, do you like Chris Rod, Raymar? Yeah. Lennis Tech Tech Tips isn't your friend yet. Yeah. That's true. Um, but we're like, we're just, you know, we just talk about it like it's our friend. And this is something called a parasocial relationship. A parasocial relationship is a one-sided friendship, if such a thing could be said to exist, right? It's when you consider somebody your friend and they don't even know who the hell you are. You know, this isn't like in high school or something where you're like, hey, I love you. And they're like, I, you know, go away. You know, it's not like one of those things where like you like somebody and they, they don't like you back and there's all those weird high school, you know, drama. Not like that. A parasocial relationship is when I'm like, you know, my wife and I will talk about Chris Broad and if you like Char and, you know, do you think they're going to date? You know, it, and they have never met us in their life. You know, it is completely one-sided, you know, and, and it's fine as long as you can uh, recognize the fact that you have no actual relationship, right? Like you're, they're not actually your friend, right? As long as you actually understand that, it, it's kind of okay. Like it's not it's not the biggest deal in in the world. Like historians, I worked for uh, about twelve years in American history and uh, software technology in regards to American history, and um, I hung out with a lot of historians, Americanists, and. Uh, I would, uh, I would bring up a quote, you know, said by Washington or something, and they hadn't heard it before, but they would sit there and they would kind of think about it, like, hmm, yeah, 
that does sound like Washington. That sounds like something he would say, you know, because they have a mental model for Washington, right? Like, ah, that sounds like uh, old George. Yeah, he would say something like that. And that's okay, because they know that George Washington isn't their friend. Uh, sports, uh, like, have you ever hung out with, like, big, like, sports fan type people? Like, they talk about the players as if they were their, like, best friends, right? Like, oh, yeah, back in 78, so-and-so did this, and then, you know. So, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually kind of commercialized now. Like, you can actually go to cameo.com, and you can pay a, uh, you can pay a celebrity to, like, leave you a voicemail or do like a 30 second video chat with you or something like that. So yeah, they'd actually monetize parasocial relationships. Look, he's my real friend. I'm going to have Hagrid give my daughter a happy birthday call. Huh. My name is Bobby Boltray. You may recognize me from Oh, I don't know. Too, 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 too. Um, you may remember me in Carter. You may remember me in <laughs> so you can have Hagrid leave you a uh, a message, right? So, uh, right? Uh, I don't know. Christopher Lloyd, uh, Doc Brown from Back to the Future. Um, so they, they they've literally monetized it, which is quite funny. A, a friend of mine uh, met uh, one of the hobbits from Lord of the Rings at a Lord of the Rings party. Uh, Billy Brown is a really nice guy, apparently. And uh, so Luke Bryan is my husband. <laughs> he's, he's not. I, well, maybe he is. I don't. I don't know if he is, or not, but probably not. By the way, you're saying that. Uh, so yeah. So Billy Brown met her like uh, at the closing party for the Return of the King, like 2004 or something like that. I don't know. And uh, and her uh, current uh, boyfriend uh, paid couple hundred bucks for Billy Brown to leave her a, a, a video message saying, hey, do you remember me from the party in 2004? I just want to wish you a happy birthday. And yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it is what it is. Now, the trouble with the trouble with parasocial relationships, because like I said, I, I don't want to I don't want to portray them as completely negative. Right. Because as long as you understand reality that they're not actually your friend, it's fine. Right. But the, the trouble is it can turn into delusion. Right. That they're actually your friend. Right. And uh, people with anxiety or low self-esteem oftentimes use parasocial relationships as a substitute for human interaction. So rather than going out and forming real friendships and having a social network, which is really important in, in, in life, like having, having a network of people that you like and like you and support each other is really useful. I, I may be going in for surgery on Tuesday. I don't know yet. They still, I'm waiting on the, the phone call. Um, but I've got friends, and I'm like, hey, I need you to take because they don't allow you to drive after you've, you know, been put under, right? And so, uh, you know, I've got friends, and I call them I'm like, hey, you know, would you mind, you know, picking me up from the the hospital after, uh, you know, after the surgery's over? So it's nothing, nothing serious. Don't worry about it. Um, and and that you know is one of the best advice I can give you for going through life is just form a good network of people that you like and they like you. Um, toxic people, people that stress you out, people that. Uh, you know, make you depressed when you hang out with them, just like distance yourself from them as much as you can, you know, and be around people that are positive and make you feel good about yourself and you make them feel good about themselves and, and things like that. So, um, uh, parasocial relationships open you up for exploitation, Patreon, OnlyFans, and Twitch. All these people are like, if you want to be my friend, just offer me money, you know. They're not your friend, they're just taking your money, you know, so. Um... You know, there's, I don't know how many billions of dollars, like Twitch is like 4 billion or 10 billion now a year. You know, and a lot of it is like people are giving money to these, like, you know, friends of theirs that aren't friends. They're just like, oh, hey, thanks, Chase, for your $100 donation. You're awesome. You know, and oh, he said my name, you know. <laughs> They're getting really rich. Yeah, it, well, some of them are. Right? The, the top streamers do. Like, most people don't make any money off of it. Um, you know, the, 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 you know, I, I consider it exploitative in, in some circumstances, maybe not all, but, um, you know, they sort of pretend to be your friend. You can be friends with a celebrity and talk to them 
and all you have to do is give them money. And that doesn't sound like a good friendship to me. You know what I mean? So. XQC makes eight million a month off of donations and subs. Yeah, that's it's a lot of money. So, um, celebrity can be actually very hard on streamers. Um, uh, su success in general can be hard on people. Like it, it sounds weird, and it's probably a a better problem to have than being a failure. You know, <laughs> all things considered, I'd rather have eight million dollars than not. You know, what I mean, eight million a month than not. But it's extremely stressful. You know, and a lot of these Twitch streamers, if you've ever watched them talk, like they feel like they have to go live and stream every night, or they'll lose their fan base. Right. And sometimes you just want to curl into a ball and just like eat chocolate and, you know, like just not do anything, right? But they have to go out there and be funny and be like, oh, Five Nights at Freddy's, uh, you know, oh, I'm so scared, uh, you know, and mug for the camera and all this kind of stuff. And it's actually very mentally um, damaging, you know, in, in a lot of cases to these people. And so in, in a certain sense, when you're subscribing to them, like, you're contributing to their mental health issues. Um, at the same time, I think they would prefer having your sub than not, <laughs> right? So, uh, so um, yeah, I mean, a friend of mine started a online uh, following. You know, I don't, I don't want to call it a cult. She calls it a cult, but uh, you know, thousands of people following you, listening to your every word you know, getting hundreds of likes every time you post something or whatever, like it, very, very rough on her. I don't, I don't honestly think it's a good thing. Um, anyhow, so uh, stalking is a big issue. Stalking is probably one of the biggest things of a parasocial relationship. Um, one of the guys who runs the um, Discord server we're on, he uh, sort of handles the tech side of things for a famous streamer. I don't know the name, so don't bother asking me. Uh, but apparently she gets like stalkers like like hey were you at this intersection the other day you know and she she's never said like what city she's in what you know she does for a living any of this stuff and people just use the little clues from like hearing an airplane fly overhead like things like that to try and locate her location and so uh, she had to tell him like hey if you ever see any people on the stream post about this particular town. I don't even know where she lives. Like, let's say it's in Ohio or something. Like, if uh, if you ever see any references to this town in Ohio, just delete them off the stream immediately. You know, keep an eye out. And, and he doesn't even know where she lives exactly, but she had to give him enough clues that, like, if those things pop up on the stream, he purges them immediately so that people can't triangulate her location. It's, it's actually quite scary, if you think about it, you know? Uh, it's super creepy. Yeah, it's super creepy. And um, <clears throat> on a more amusing uh, side, uh, definitely a cult. Uh, th different person, by the way. That my friend is not. I, I, I've never met the person that he he works for. I, I don't even know her name or her streaming name, so don't you know? Don't ask. I, I, I actually don't know. But my friend who did the the cult, like, um, no, she just she just travels in public and <laughs> yeah, she'll 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 do meetups with like random people on the internet, and there's hundreds of people there she's never met before. And she'll fly around the country to meet people from her cult. And I'm just like, okay, you know. One of them died and she flew out to his funeral and took donations and things like that. It's like, <sighs> what if one of them was a creep? These are two different people. These are two different people, Griselda. One is this online streamer and the other one's my, my friend who has a different online following thousands of people so um yeah sounds like a cool job yeah, I, I guess i don't know but um yeah stalkers have come after justin bieber taylor swift um john lennon i think was killed by one dan rather um uh, jody foster had like a mass like had a murderer i think following her around um dan rather was like attacked by a guy saying like what's the frequency kenneth i think uh, Which R uh, REM turned into a, uh, a song <laughs> about it. Uh, 
when two unknown people attack Dan Rather while repeating Kenneth, what is the frequency? Uh, he was attacked and punched from behind by a man. Um, Um, and so it turned out to be, where is it? Where do you go? Solve the mystery, the assailant, uh, killed a different person in NBC, uh, outside the Today Show. Um, yeah, and he was trying to force his way in. So, I don't know if that exactly counts as a stalker. It seems like more like he was stalking NBC, but I don't know. Yeah, Jodie Foster had a, a person murder, I, I think, uh, who was the... Uh, yeah, he shot the President of the United States to impress Jodie Foster, right? Uh, John Hinckley, right? Yeah, like, the President of the United States, right? Like, not like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, uh, do you guys get what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's pretty, like, bad, you know? Like, when you're stalking somebody because he, he was in love with her, you know? It's a parasocial relationship. He, he thought he was in love with Jodie Foster. He saw her in a movie or something. I don't remember which one. And, like... I think in the movie, maybe it was like Taxi Driver or something like that. Um, and anyway, like somebody talked about murdering something to impress her. And so he's like, oh, that's what I've got to do. And and so he shoots the President of the United States of America. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, actually, I have a quote right here. Jody, I would abandon this idea of getting Reagan in a second if only I could win your heart. John Hingley Jr., the day he shot President Reagan. Okay, yeah. So, there you go. Um, Yeah. And, and so basically a lot of streamers have issues with, with stalkers because the stalkers can't tell the difference between a regular friendship and a parasocial relationship. Okay. So, uh, there's also something called the Dunning-Kroger effect. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't really know that much about it, but uh, I consider myself an expert. <laughs> Have you ever met anybody like that? They've, they've studied a, a subject for like all of five minutes and they think that they're, uh, you know, they're an authority on the subject. Let me tell you about Ukraine, you know. I just Googled it. Your boyfriend. <laughs> Lots of times. Yeah. So the uh, same people that, uh, you know, were experts on the coronavirus last week or experts on the Ukraine crisis this week. And, uh <laughs> Too many people. Yeah. So the Dunning-Kroger effect is uh, when you overestimate your knowledge of a subject. Okay. So I'm lecturing on the Dunning-Kroger effect, right? And I don't really know very much about it. In fact, I misspelled the name. <laughs> Kroger is the name of a grocery store. I don't know if you guys know that, right? Uh, did I? Yeah. Kroger's grocery. Okay. Okay, I misspelled that the grocery name too. Okay, uh, but it's the Dunning Kruger effect, not the Dunning Kroger effect, right? So, the Dunning uh, Kruger effect is uh, when you start learning about something, you tend to really badly overestimate how much knowledge you have on the subject. Like, I've studied it for five minutes. I feel like I know about ninety percent of this topic. You know, and. Uh, this doesn't take place in some fields like uh, calculus, right? Because in calculus, you start off and it just crushes you with the value of despair right off the bat. Like, I, I don't know, did anybody here, like, in their first week of calculus, you're like, yeah, I know calculus. I don't know, maybe some of you did. But, like, uh, in general, like, some, some topics are so hard that, like, nobody, like, goes immediately to the peak amount stupid. This is typically more in, like, social issues. You watch a... You watch a <laughs> you were like, I don't know calculus. <laughs> um, this is a good one here. How much, how much you actually know and how much you think you know. Right? So when you start learning, people radically overestimate how much they know. Not everyone, but a lot of people. I know everything about it. You know, teenagers, you know, like uh, 
uh, Mark Twain said, uh, when I was a teenager, um, what did he say? What was his quote? When I was a teenager, uh, like I couldn't believe how dumb my dad was or something like that. And then by the time I turned 20, I was impressed by how much he learned. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. When I was a teenager, I thought my dad was a moron. And then by the time I turned 20, I was impressed by how much he learned in the meantime. Uh, and so basically, you study it a little bit. You're like, oh, I know everything. And then as you start getting into it, you're like, oh, wow, this is actually really complicated. You know? And then you learn more and you're like, oh, wow, there's a lot more that I, I, I learn. That I need to learn, you know? Because at first you don't even know how much there is to learn, right? And so, and so you, you're like, oh, I got a pretty good grasp on it. Russian-Ukrainian uh, relations. I, yeah, I got I watched a five-minute news section on CNN. I know everything, you know? <laughs> you know, the, the, whereas the history goes back centuries, right? And, um, and if you haven't, like, studied World War II history, especially in that particular region of Eastern Europe... Um, nothing's going to make sense to you, you know, but like, oh, I know everything. And then you, as you start learning, you're like, oh, wow, there's actually a lot to this, you know? And then by the time you get your doctorate, like, you're like, okay, I feel like reasonably confident that I know what I'm talking about now because I'm a specialist in Ukrainian history. <laughs> you know, I can speak uh, Russian with the Ukrainian dialect. I, you know, and, and even still, your confidence still isn't as high as a doctorate as it is with a person who spent five minutes on Google, right? One of the really interesting things about the uh, freshman during the first semester of their major, yeah, uh, go to a go to a freshman philosophy class. <laughs> all the problems of philosophy, all the problems of philosophy are solved within five minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, at this conference last week, everybody there was a professor, almost like eighty percent of the people there were professors. And so you might think that there was a lot of confidence, right? Like a lot of people like, yeah, I know my stuff. You're a moron. I know better than you. I saw that once when I was there. And that was just a person like, because we were having to do a programming assignment live. You know, all the professors with their laptops tap, tapping away. And one of the guys just kept complaining about the assignment. He's like, I wouldn't do the assignment this way. You should have assigned the value of negative infinity rather than zero. And and the, the guy's like, this is for people in their second week of programming. They don't know about negative infinity. Just roll with it. You know, he's like, well, I have one. You know, but that was the one time in probably uh, 60 hours of workshops and lectures and things like that that I saw any sort of like ego or bravado or anything like that. Why? Because professors know how much there is out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm pretty good at computer science like I'm pretty good at programming like I I can do a lot and I I can tell you all sorts of things that I'm just not good at in computer science just things that I've never had time to get around to doing or learning right like JavaScript really doesn't interest me I've done it I've taken classes on it but like I wouldn't consider myself proficient in JavaScript at all like web development hell no hire somebody else don't hire me you know um, and at this conference, like, everybody's sitting there just, like, very humble because, like, they know everybody in that room is highly educated, you know. And uh, it was really interesting. I went to a talk by Berkeley, right? UC Berkeley gave this talk. A whole panel of very smart people up on stage giving the talks. And uh, the guy that was the head of the project, data science at Berkeley, it's, the, it's a new major. It's only, like, five or six years old. It's now, like, the second largest major at Berkeley. The guy who's in charge of that, he's like, yeah, I get imposter syndrome all the time because I'm around a lot of smart people. You know, my PhD is in agriculture. <laughs> and somehow I ended up doing all this data science stuff. And I'm surrounded by like PhDs in computer science. My background's in farming economics. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, okay, that's fair. Because like they asked me to speak at the Berkeley conference two years ago. And like, I don't know anything about data science. I'm a computer science major. Like, I can program. But, like, as far as data science goes, I don't know anything, you know. And so uh, um, I, I spoke anyway, and, and uh, my talk was, like, my name is Bill Kearney. I'm here to tell you about data science at Clovis Community College in Fresno, California. <clears throat> Clovis Community College in Fresno, California has no data science program. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> That's my, that my speech. And uh, 
uh, got a got a good laugh out of the crowd, and then I talked about some other things they wanted me to talk about, like transferring, like how transferring is kind of a problem. Uh, but like, yeah, I, I was just like, I really shouldn't be up on stage, you know, virtual stage. I, I really shouldn't be on stage with these people because I don't know anything. So, you know, the, you know, whenever it comes down to like your confidence and like Dunning Kruger effect, just try to try to like stay kind of in the middle zone. Is you know, Aristotelian Nicomachean ethics, right? The golden mean between confidence and bravado and the Dunning Kroger effect, where you're just like, I know everything about Putin, you know, to like, on the other side is imposters, imposter syndrome, right? And almost everybody experiences imposter syndrome at some point. And uh, two minutes, miss. And uh, just try to try to keep the uh, try to keep yourself in that sort of happy median between the two, because just realize every person you meet probably knows something you don't. And every person you meet doesn't know something you know, right? My wife's much smarter than me in uh, pharmacy and biology and uh, gardening and cooking and a lot of things, right? And I'm better than her at uh, taking out the trash, <laughs> driving. Roast a carrot and okonomiyaki tonight. Nice, nice. Butter chicken tomorrow. <laughs> you don't have to butter me up anymore. Butter you up anymore. So, right, and and so that's that's kind of what I'm getting at here with the Dunning Kroger effect. So, um, yeah, I, I I've I've literally had somebody tell me, oh, computer science, anyone can do that. And I'm like, the hell you say. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Because that is the sign that you have no idea what you're talking about. Because computer science is hard. Like, I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Like, this class is designed to be like a gentle introduction to computer science. But it, it, it's like learning a foreign language. You know, there is no way of easily learning a foreign language. Like, at a certain point, you have to sit down and memorize thousands of words. How do you say if, then, but, me, you, the numbers, the colors, verbs, adjectives, grammar... You, there's just a lot of work that goes into learning a foreign language and learning to program is the closest thing neurologically speaking is is learning a foreign language and there's just no easy path to mastery on it you just have to put the time in and so when this guy told me who's a business partner by the way uh said oh computer science anyone could do that they're a diamond dozen i'm like <laughs> excuse me <laughs> and so it's a failure of metacognition it means you're not good at thinking about your own thinking and recognizing flaws in it right so, uh, yeah, people who know a little bit about evolution will criticize evolution based on their bad understanding. People who know a little bit about theology will criticize theology based on their bad understanding. And I think you can find some of those on, like, the Debate Religion Forum, on Reddit, um, all sorts of bad theology on there, 24 hours a day. And then, like I said, as people start learning a subject, uh, their confidence level usually drops because you're like, wow, there's actually a lot to computer science. There are people in the Fresno State Computer Science Department whose um, specializations, I actually don't know what they are. Like, I don't, I don't even know what their specialization is. Not, not that I haven't, like, studied it or whatever, which is normal. Like, there's people who have studied machine learning, and I, I've done a little bit, but not really. I actually don't even know what their specialization means. And at this point, I'm too afraid to ask, right? So... Uh, we can find the Department of Computer Science people here. Uh, let's see, virtual tour. Where is the research advising? Where is the faculty? We're basically done for today. About faculty. Here we go. All right. So um, here we go. Oh, uh, oh, I'm on there. That's cool. Uh, I don't have a photo. What happened? What happened to my photo? All right. Um, let's pick somebody. Oh, he doesn't have any there. Okay. Uh, yeah, somewhere on there, there's like a faculty list, and like a and and they're they're like in theory and things like this, and I'm just like I don't even know what that means. <laughs> you know, so and does it bother me a little bit, but not really. You know, because computer science is so huge; it's a gigantuan, gargantuan field, right? And it just doesn't bother me because there is a huge amount of things you could possibly learn. And even by the time you get your doctorate, you're going to know like 1% of it, you know, and that's, and that's okay. That's okay. As long as you know the important stuff, the core stuff, um, 
that's that's all that really matters. Okay, so that's uh, that's it for today. Oh, we got like a, we got a couple more to do on uh, on Monday then, and then we'll jump into social issues in computer science next week. Uh, make sure you get your fallacies in for the fallacy scavenger hunt on Monday. I will look over your spacey invaders today over the weekend. Try and get them graded. And uh, any questions about the cognitive biases today? Mind reading. You think you know what people are thinking, but you don't. Black and white thinking. All good, all bad. Catastrophic thinking. It's a disaster. Parasocial relationships. I'm friends with that person when you're not. I'm friends with that streamer. Somebody you've never met, right? They don't even know who you are. Or maybe they've seen your name on like a stream or something, but like they don't know you. Uh, Dunning-Kroger, uh, which again I deliberately misspelled, is thinking you're an expert when you're not. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns? Think I'm following to the Dunning-Kroger. You're a lot more confident until you, until you take the quiz. That's one of the benefits of a quiz, right? Quizzes are actually learning opportunities. They, uh, because your brain will, will deceive you, right, into thinking, oh, yeah, I understand that, until you have to do it, and you're like, oh, I don't know how to do that. You know, it's a, it's a great reality check. Okay. All right. That's it for today. Uh, I will see you all on Monday, virtually, of course. And uh, like I said, next week we'll finish up cognitive biases and then move on to social issues and computer science again. All right. Peace out, everyone. See ya.